I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can join our mailing list and access premium content at CapitalAllocators.com. My guest on today's show is Louis Vincent Gov, the founding partner and CEO of GovCal, a leading independent provider of macro research, and GovCal Capital, manager of $2 billion in assets. Louis is one of my go-to sources for strategic research. He came on the show earlier this year to discuss the conflict in Ukraine, and that conversation is replayed on the feed. This time around, we cover Louis's perspective on the bear market and its transition of leadership from developed to emerging markets. We discuss emerging markets, the US dollar, age of weaponization, deglobalization, China, and where to invest to weather the storm. Before we get going, this week, I'm going to let you in on another hot tip. Stone Point Capital will be featured on our third episode of Private Equity Deals. I've measured out a probability distribution of outcomes, and I'm highly confident this one will be well worth your time. We might even have to open that TikTok account to do a little victory dance. You'll be able to hear the show on Wednesday by subscribing to our new podcast, Private Equity Deals. Thanks so much for spreading the word. Please enjoy my conversation with Louis Vincent Goff. Louis Vincent, thanks so much for doing this again. My pleasure. It's good to see you, Ted. I'd love to dive in. We're certainly going to be talking about this bear market, but it might make sense to start with how you think about cyclicality and bull markets. Well, let me start off with what I was told when I started in this business. One of my very first clients, a guy called Biat Knotts, who started a firm called Notchtuki in Geneva, a very successful firm. He's unfortunately passed away now, but at the start of my career, I said, Louis, you have to understand it's an easy business. You have to figure out if there's more money than fools or more fools than money. <laughs> when there's more money than fools, markets go up. And when there's more fools than money, markets go down. Because at the end of the day, financial markets are really a big reservoir of excess liquidity. You, me, everybody needs money to go through our daily lives, to buy stuff, to pay for the energy we need, to pay for our food, pay for everything. And when there's stuff left over, it tends to go into financial markets. By the same token, when there's not enough money to go around, it tends to come out of financial markets, especially equities, because equities are liquid and deep markets. If you think of financial markets as liquidity reservoirs, and as market cycles, really as liquidity cycles, are we in a phase of expanding liquidity? Are we in a more money than fools or more fools than money phase? I think if you look at today, it's pretty obvious that not only are we in a more fools than money phase, we're actually in an outright liquidity crisis because you have a lot of drains on liquidity at the same time. First, of course, you have the rising price of food and energy, which is your bare bones. That's draining a lot of excess liquidity from the market. And then your other big drain, of course, is increasingly central banks. The challenging thing right now for any investor is all the signs are there that you're in a liquidity squeeze. You've got the US dollar going through the roof. You have central bank reserves held at the Fed for foreign central banks, which is for us a key indicator of liquidity. That's been shrinking all year. So that's a clear sign there's not enough money to go around. Obviously, you've got rising energy. And the Fed is picking this moment in time where there's not enough dollars to say, you know what, I'm going to take some out. So today, we are in a very tough liquidity environment that makes it hard for valuations to expand. As you look at this particular bear market at the beginning of the sell-off earlier this year, What's different or special about this one compared to others in the past? It's like the misery in Tolstoy's families. Everybody's miserable, but in different ways. And that's the same for bear markets. They're all miserable, but in different ways. What is different this time? The most obvious and glaring difference is how this year you're losing more money on long bonds than you are on equities. This is a game changer. The past 30 or 40 years of market behavior has taught everyone that bonds and equities are negatively correlated, and clearly this is no longer the case. Let's say you're an average pension fund and you had a lot of your money in equities, a lot of your money on bonds. This year, you're losing on both fronts. So actually, the total capital losses this time around are bigger than they were in 2008. Because in 2008, if you had a diversified portfolio, you took your licks on your equities, but your bonds came through. This is absolutely not the case this time. 
this time, there's basically been nowhere to hide but energy. Energy is the one asset class that's up for the year. Unfortunately, for pretty much every pension fund, endowment, et cetera, out there, they all bought into the ESG stuff. And so they have none of that. Of the one asset class that could have saved them, and they still don't. That's the amazing thing. You would think that, okay, everything is going down, this is going up, so let's do more of what's going well, and let's do less of what's not going well. But that's still not happening. You've talked quite a bit about how bear markets change leadership, and that's the purpose of bear markets. Would love to walk through that thesis and then how you see it playing out right now. At heart, I'm an emerging market guy. I've spent 25 years in China. Actually, we met through the good offices of our mutual friend, Richard Lawrence, who is, for me, the ultimate emerging market guy. He's probably the best equity guy in emerging markets in not one, but two or three generations. When you've done EM for 25 years, you're used to getting punched in the face. <laughs> it comes with a territory. Like every five years or so, you're going to get flattened, especially in liquidity crises. Whenever there's not enough dollars to go around, historically, emerging markets have been the redhead stepchild. They're the first one to get beaten up. But this is what's amazing for me in this cycle. Amidst this bear market, you're seeing a number of emerging markets that are actually up for the year. If you look at Singapore, if you look at Indonesia, if you look at Brazil, if you look at India, all these markets are actually up for the year. They're up on their equity markets and they're up on their bond markets, or they're roughly flat, depending on which ones. If a year ago we'd met up and I had said, hey, Ted, guess what? In the coming year, US inflation is going to be much stronger than expected. Energy prices are going to go through the roof. The Fed is going to be much more hawkish than anybody expects. The DXY is going to go up 20% year on year. Oh, and by the way, load up on emerging markets because that will be the saving grace. You'd have said, Louis, you're an imbecile. You've been doing emerging markets for 25 years. Don't you know that when there's a Fed tightening cycle, you sell emerging markets, you don't buy them. And yet here we are. This is unfolding in front of our very eyes. And this feeds into one of my big themes is that bear markets are not fun, but they're important. They're there for a reason. They're there to allow the transition from one group of leaders to the next. And so while you're in the bear market and you're getting punched in the face, the natural tendency is to hold on to the previous winners and think they're going to come back. I'm going to hold on to my Facebook and that's going to come back. And I'm going to hold on to my Netflix and I'm going to hold on to my NVIDIA because these are great companies and it's going to come back. Meanwhile, the market moves on. It's not against you, but the market is moving on to the next story, to the next thing. And right now, the two clear trends that are in the market are one, outperformance of a number of emerging markets. And I think this outperformance is currently being hidden by China. China is such a big weight in the EM indices that it's overbearing and China has its own issues, but people aren't looking beyond that. So the emerging market outperformance, the outperformance of Brazil, of Mexico, of India, of Indonesia, of Singapore, et cetera, all that is being hidden by China. That's one thing. And then the other thing, of course, is the outperformance of energy. When I talk to people about it, they're like, oh yeah, I can't do anything about that. I can't invest, which tells me great news. It's got lots of room to grow. A lot of the direction of what's happening with rates and equity markets, as you described, flies right in the face of the traditional 60-40 portfolio, whether it's 60, 40, 70, 30, 80, 20. I'd love to hear your recommendations of how someone should think about allocating their capital given what's happening right now. The worst thing about the 80, 20, 60, 40, et cetera. If you're a private wealth firm, you might have run three portfolios, a neutral, an aggressive, a conservative. And maybe your conservative was 40, 60 and your neutral 50, 50 and your aggressive 70, 30 or something like that. A lot of firms today, the aggressive portfolios are doing better than the conservative portfolios in the midst of a bear market because the bonds are doing worse than the equities. That's your first big issue now. What do you do about it? For me, I look at building a portfolio like putting together a football team. Everybody's got different jobs. You don't expect your offensive lineman to run the 100 meters in 10.5 seconds. You don't expect your quarterback to be the best tackler on the team and so on and so forth. Everybody's got very specific jobs. Well, government bonds for 30 years were the best offensive line in the business. They protected the assets like nobody else's business. They were just amazing. And the reality is they're no longer doing that job. It's like they went on holiday and instead of coming back weighing 350 pounds, they're now weighing 150 pounds because <laughs> real rates are too low for them to do their business. So who needs a 150 pound offensive lineman? Nobody. So you take him off the field and you look at your bench, you're like, okay, who can block for me here? Who can do the job? And the answer today is there's two assets. The new two anti-fragile assets are one energy and the other is emerging market bonds. I'll briefly go into both up to late August. So eight months this year, 
long dated US treasuries were down seven out of those eight months. Energy stocks were up six out of these eight months. You had a number of months, January, February, August, when bonds and equities fell and energy equities were up, which inherently makes sense because the risk today is on inflation. Every central banker is trying to put inflation back in its box. The risk in the system is that inflation continues to rise. And therefore, central banks will stay tight in this tight liquidity environment that we've already discussed. How does inflation stay high? The obvious way is if energy prices continue to go up. The asset that is now negatively correlated to everybody else is energy. If energy prices go up, everything else will go down. Meanwhile, if energy prices go down, everything else will go up. So fine, I won't make money on energy, but I'll make money on the rest of the stuff. So I'll be happy. Energy is the new anti-fragile asset for your portfolio. Now, the more energy is negatively correlated to everything else, so much money nowadays is managed by computers. Computers will start picking up on this and say, oh, okay, this is good. It's positive returns. It's negatively correlated. We need to put more in energy. Who's going to be the seller? Historically, the energy companies themselves would turn around and say, hey, you guys like this paper. I'll give you some more. Give me your money and I'm going to go drill some holes in the desert somewhere. But today they're not doing that. Instead, they're actually going out and buying back their shares and issuing special dividends and whatever else. They're returning capital to shareholders like Microsoft and Apple were 10 years ago. So we're now in the phase of the cycle where more money is going to flow into energy and the energy companies are busy giving it back to shareholders. It creates this upward spiral. Energy for me is the new bonds. It's more volatile than bonds, unfortunately, but it is negatively correlated to everything else in your portfolio. Now, if you're looking for bond-like returns with somewhat bond-like volatility, today you're going to find it in emerging market bonds. Like I mentioned, you look at Chinese bonds, they've massively outperformed in spite of all this bad news from China and foreign outflows and zero COVID and Taiwan invasion fears, et cetera. Chinese bonds have outperformed US treasuries by 15% this year. It's a shocker. The same story with Indonesian bonds, same story with Brazilian bonds. This is the first Fed tightening cycle in my lifetime where emerging market bonds are crushing U.S. treasuries, German boons, JGBs. It's an important message there. To me, that trend makes sense for all the reasons we discussed. Historically, when you think about emerging market bonds relative to, say, U.S. or maybe European bonds, the first thing you think about is sovereign credit risk. As you talked about, the Fed's behavior might not be all that much different than what you've seen in some of the governments of the emerging markets historically. How do you think about assimilating the notion of sovereign credit risk into a shift potentially in owning developed market bonds to owning emerging market bonds? That's a great point. Whenever you look at EM bonds, you have the local currency bonds and the US dollar bonds. The interesting trend in emerging markets, if you go back 20 years ago, there really was no local currency bond market, very little. It was all US dollar debt. You wanted to buy Indonesia, you bought it in US dollar. You wanted to buy Philippines, you wanted to buy Brazil, partly because their own currencies were trash. Who would want to own the Indonesian rupiah over the long term or the Filipino peso over the long term? That, that makes no sense. I think this is the part that has really changed in the past 10 years is you look at the local currency debt markets in a lot of these places, they've grown tremendously, not only from the sovereign, but also on the corporate side. There's now a genuine local currency debt market for corporates in Latin America. And the same is true across Asia. China is now the world's second largest bond market and it's all local currency stuff. The only country to ever go bust on its local currency bonds is Russia. In 98 or 99, they basically decided to stiff foreigners because that's how they are. You don't go bust on your local currencies. I mean, you can always print it. Now, of course, then the currency goes down, et cetera. But today, the currency printing is really being done by the Western world much more than emerging markets who have learned their lessons, have gone through the inflation cycles. And it's the old story. You don't make your father's mistakes, you make your grandfather's mistakes. Asia, Latin America, post-1990, the Asian crisis, the Latin American crisis of late 90s, they've had to deal with all of that. So now they follow much sounder fiscal and monetary policies. And in the Western world, we didn't. So we're going to be paying the price. I think the next coming years, we're now entering a cycle of revaluation of Asian currencies, revaluation of emerging market bonds relative to those of the Western world. I think it started. And I think very few people are positioned for it. The last piece of this that's always impossible to get right is timing. But that's the good news. It's already started. Just get on the train. The trend is your friend, right? I agree. You don't pick bottoms. But here, you're not picking a bottom. The trend is already going. Just get on board and join the party. What do you see as people's resistance to adopting what you think is the right thing to do? The first thing, of course, is we're living in this age of weaponization, this feeling that going abroad is too risky. The geopolitical risk perspective has changed dramatically in the past few years, and even more so, of course, in the past six months with the Russian invasion. 
depending on which part of the world you're in, things may look too risky. So for example, trying to sell China to US institution or even a European institution today, forget it. It's not going to happen. You're wasting your time. But Latin America, then you could say, well, Latin America, everybody's electing leftists, left and right. But today's leftists in America are not the leftists from a generation ago. Again, you learn from your father's mistakes. In Latin America, you talk to guys in Chile and in Colombia and in Mexico, they've learned from Chavez. They've learned from Argentina. They don't want to repeat that. What was it, four or five years ago when AMLO came to power? Everybody was like, oh, he's the next Chavez. It's going to be a disaster. But Mexico hasn't been that bad. He's definitely not being the Chavez. So if you don't want to do it, there's always a reason to not do it. In emerging markets, there's always a reason. It doesn't smell right. The streets are dirty. It's too far from me. I can't drink the water. There's always a good reason not to do it. But by the time there's every reason to do it, it's usually the time you don't want to do it anymore. The old story in emerging markets is if you can sell a country fund, you don't want to buy it. By the time you get the cover of The Economist as to how China is going to take over the world or how India is going to take over the world or how Brazil is taking off, remember that Economist cover with that Rio de Janeiro cross taking off into the sky, etc. That's usually a sure sign that, okay, time for me to cash out. We're at the time now where there's lots of reason to not go in emerging markets and the momentum is positive. So it looks good to me. So as you look at that transition happening with leadership from emerging markets and equities and bonds, why do you think it's happening? Potentially lots of reasons. Right now, the core belief in the market is that you've got a big stinking pile of laundry and the US is the cleanest dirty shirt, therefore I should be in the US. Right now, the view is Russia is obviously uninvestable, so we can leave that one aside. Europe is uninvestable because they might not have electricity this winter, so who wants to take that risk? China is uninvestable because they might invade Taiwan tomorrow. And I don't believe that for a second, by the way, but who wants to take that political risk? So perhaps the simplest explanation is once you cross out everybody for being uninvestable, you're not left with a lot. You're left with US, you're left with India, Indonesia, et cetera. And those are small markets. One possible explanation is as people leave China, as people leave Russia, as people leave Europe, it doesn't take a lot of money saying, okay, fine, I'll buy India and Indonesia to move those markets. That's one possibility. The other possibility why these markets are doing well even in the face of a US dollar wrecking ball, because usually as the US dollar goes up, emerging markets struggle. Today, everyone sees the strength in the US dollar as a sign of strength of the US. US dollar is strong because it's the cleanest dirty shirt. US is awesome and everything else is terrible. Now, personally speaking, through my career, I've seen periods of massive currency strength that were not actually a reflection of strength, but of weakness. I'll give you two examples through what I mean. In 2010, 2011, I launched a fund called the European Divergence Fund to short European credit and short the euro. And my view was one of those two things has to break. Between mid-2010 and mid-2011, the euro moved from 120 to 150. I don't forget because I still have the scars <laughs> that stole over my body from that rise because I kept buying euro puts and it kept not being so good. I was like, Europe is heading straight into a wall. And it did hit the wall finally in 2011 with the European crisis, et cetera. But the euro kept rising. And the reason it was rising was not strength. All the European companies were repatriating capital. All the European banks, the European pension funds. Europe was bleeding. You could see it all over the data. It was slowing down. You had issues. And the euro was going up on capital repatriation. And talking about this with my father, he said, you think you had pain. He used to run a big macro firm back in the early 90s. And as he put it to me, it was obvious that Japan had hit the wall in 1990, 1991. The yen moved from 140 to 75. It was 140 in 1990. It was 75 in 1994, even as Japan imploded. Talk about a pain trade. It was absolutely brutal. The yen going from 140 to 75 is rising. Currencies are inverted. They're hard. All this to say, when you look at the US dollar today, today the common sense view is, U.S. is this paragon of stability, and it's the cleanest dirty shirt, and it's the only place you can deploy capital, etc. But meanwhile, you have two looming things that are staring you in the face in the U.S. The first is the coming set of corporate earnings are going to be horrible. Your currency going up 20% year on year, that has an impact on earnings, however you cut it. With the rising cost of capital in the U.S. and the rising exchange rate, the ability of U.S. corporates to massage earnings through creative accounting, issuing debt to buy back shares, et cetera, has disappeared. And with that, you have to start facing reality. And I think there's going to be a whole lot more of that. That's the first looming issue in the US. The second big thing, you know, my whole career, there's been three themes that keep coming back and coming back and coming back. The first is that China is one real estate bear market away from having its financial sector implode. 
The second is that the euro is one economic recession away from imploding. And the third is that U.S. pension funds are woefully underfunded. Right now, everybody's focusing on the first two themes, rightly so. Real estate in China is going down. Europe has big issues. Everybody forgot about the third one. Meanwhile, we've just had 15 trillion of capital destruction in the U.S. alone. If you're a U.S. pension fund, you're bleeding money on the asset side of your balance sheets, and your liabilities are going through the roof because healthcare costs are going bananas and unfunded pension funds. The question I'm asking is, could the rise in the U.S. dollar today be a reflection of corporates having to repatriate capital because their earnings are going to be terrible, and U.S. pension funds also having to repatriate capital because they are bleeding cash? And if so, then all of a sudden the picture changes, and you're like, okay, the U.S. isn't so hot. Where's left? Well, all of a sudden, Brazil doesn't look that bad. India doesn't look that bad. Indonesia, perhaps even China, if we get a good party congress. There's a fair amount of what's happened over the last couple of years in the US, particularly with the central bank, the Fed, that feels like actions of emerging markets in the past. Money printing, currency issues, repatriation of capital. With your lens looking at all these different emerging market crises over the years, where do you see similarities and differences? There's no doubt. And what's been quite interesting with the COVID crisis was the view all across the Western world. It's the US, but it's also Europe and the UK and Australia and Canada, all across Western countries. We can print a bunch of money and we can spend a bunch of money and there won't be any long-term consequences. Obviously, emerging markets followed a very different path. You look at the monetary aggregates of Brazil or China or Indonesia, they didn't grow to the same extent as we saw in the Western world. So I think there was a fair amount of hubris in the Western world where it was like, the rules don't apply to us. There's macroeconomic rules for poor countries and macroeconomic rules for rich countries. Turns out it's the same macroeconomic rules for everyone. In emerging markets, they hadn't forgotten them. And in the Western world, we're in the process of relearning them. It's a painful and costly education. You're absolutely right. That's also key differences. If you look at the divergence in fiscal and monetary policies in the past five years between Western world and developing or emerging markets, it's never been this stark. And one of the charts in my presentation is long-term comparisons between Chinese bond yields versus U.S. bond yields. Now, Chinese bond yields have been between 260 and 320 for the past five years. U.S. bond yields have been all over the shop. And you look at it, it's like, which one's the emerging market and which one's the developed market? Are there any historical analogs to what happens with this type of behavior with the world's reserve currency? There isn't a perfect one. The obvious one is the UK, of course, where the pound used to be the world's reserve currency, but it was, of course, different. It was pegged to gold on the one hand. The pound lost its preeminence as World War I and World War II bled the UK treasury dry. There's not an obvious parallel, partly because we've only lived in this perfect fiat environment for 50 years, right? Before currencies were always pegged to gold or silver or a combination or something. Currencies were always constrained. Never have they been completely unconstrained as they are today. So we only have 50 years of experience. In that 50 years, the U.S. was always the dominant currency. And it was the dominant currency for many different reasons, but one of which the obvious one is, was, of course, the currency of all commodities trade, not least of which energy. That's where perhaps there's a massive shift happening that the market is underestimating. Right now, you have the world's largest commodity exporter, namely Russia, that has been kicked out of the U.S. dollar system for its behavior. And therefore, most of Russia's commodity trades is shifting from U.S. dollar to renminbi. So the world's largest commodity exporter and the world's largest commodity importer are shifting the terms of their trade in front of our very eyes. To me, that's a pretty big deal. A few weeks ago, BHP did their first deal in iron ore for renminbi. And the reason is pretty obvious. China turns to them and says, hey, I like your iron ore. It's so much better than this Russian crap. But Russia, I can buy in renminbi. So unless you accept renminbi, I'm going to do more with Russia and less with you. Now that BHP accepts RMB, what are the odds that China is going to go back to trading in US dollars with RMB? They're not. Instead, China is going to turn to Vale and Rio Tinto and say, your buddies at BHP, they accept RMB. So if you want our business, maybe you should do the same. I think things are changing very rapidly in front of our eyes. The market's reaction to this is a sort of knee jerk reaction. Ooh, there's a lot of uncertainty. I'm going to buy the US dollar and I'm going to buy US assets. I'm not sure it's the right response. This idea of using currencies as a weapon to make significant economic shifts in the geopolitical power struggle, there's been a lot of this recently. Some stuff you've written about, you've called it the age of weaponization. would love to hear some more of your thoughts about different ways that these nations battling with each other are weaponizing different aspects of the financial system. 
thanks. You're giving me the opportunity to plug my two latest books. So I will. <laughs> so I've written two books on this, one called Clash of Empires, which I wrote in 2018, and the other recently, Avoiding the Punch. The first book I wrote was basically following the weaponization of the semiconductor industry against China. We talked a little bit about it last time we chatted, but for me, that was a game changer. All of a sudden, the U.S. president saying, okay, nobody's allowed to sell semiconductors to Huawei and to ZTE because we don't like these companies. It was a shift in global industrial supply chains because now all of a sudden, if you're China, you have to look at everything and say, okay, I can't be dependent on the U.S. for anything. I can't be dependent on the U.S. for chemical products, for airline spare parts. I just have to renationalize everything, which inherently means a lot less productivity, inherently means higher inflation, poor use of capital. It basically sounded the death of globalization, which was, in my eyes, the main force for the global deflationary forces. To your point, since then, we saw the U.S. weaponize the semiconductor industry against China. You've definitely seen, following the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, the Western world weaponize their financial systems against Russia. And then you saw, of course, Russia's only possible response, which is weaponize the energy industry. It turns out really against Europe. So we now live in a world where every major power seems to be weaponizing whatever their own comparative advantage is. In the Western world, it's our control of financial pipelines and our control of the semiconductor industry. In Russia, it's energy. In China, it's supply chains. Everybody's weaponizing what they're good at, not to try to benefit themselves, but to actively try to trip up the next guy. And everybody trying to trip up the next guy makes for much lower productivity, much lower growth, much higher inflation. So you had the combination of those activities and then through COVID, the issues with supply chains, it certainly feels like we're on a trend towards a deglobalized economy from what was for many decades an increase in globalization. How do you see the impact of that deglobalization playing out in the next couple of years? There's no doubt we are deglobalizing. The obvious impact is higher inflation. It's higher inflation, it's lower margins, higher structural interest rates, which makes for lower valuations. Going back to your underfunded U.S. pension plans, that's the worst of both worlds. On the one hand, your asset prices are lower, but the money you have to pay out keeps on accelerating. And this at the worst possible of times when you're getting more and more old people all across the Western world. You could say, okay, but it's great on the other side. We're going to get more jobs back in the U.S. We're going to get more jobs back in Europe, etc. But it's not like labor markets aren't tight already. Labor markets are already pretty tight. So we're going to say, okay, let's reshore everything from China. The question becomes, well, how'd you do it? Where did you find your workers? The big debate we have internally is, on the one hand, labor market is tight. On the other, the labor participation rate is not that great in the US. It's still lower than what it was pre-COVID. And here you get to other structural issues, which are particularly acute in the US. The whole lockdown thing made a couple of problems that are inherent to the US and to the US labor force worse, most notably obesity which prevents a lot of people from holding the type of manufacturing jobs where you have to be sitting up and doing a lot of things. That's a pretty acute problem for the U.S. workforce, and it's gotten much worse with the lockdown and with COVID. And the other is opioid use, which is another big problem that's sort of specific to the U.S. How do you bring back a bunch of jobs if a growing percentage of your workforce is too obese to work or too whacked out on drugs to work? It's hard. So you end up saying, okay, fine, we're not going to do it in the US. We're going to do it in Mexico. We're going to do it in other places in Latin America. We're going to do it in the parts of the world that we feel confident in. So for Europe, bad luck. That was Eastern Europe. That was the reservoir of labor. But now if you're a French CEO of a big company, how comfortable do you feel putting a big factory in Poland? Probably less comfortable than a year ago. All these deglobalization, it's like, okay, fine, we can move from China. Where do we go? Okay, maybe we go to Indonesia. Maybe we go to Mexico. Maybe we go to India. Maybe we go to Brazil. As it turns out, these are the markets that are outperforming, both on the bond side and on the equity side. So maybe we don't fight it. Maybe the trends make sense. It corresponds to everything we're seeing. And the markets are telling you this is where you're supposed to be. I'd love to turn to some more of your thoughts on China. There are certainly questions for the Western investor of whether China is investable going out a couple of years with all the things Xi Jinping is doing or potentially consolidating his power. From being on the ground for that long, I'd love to get your perspective on what this looks like out a couple of years. Boy, I wish we were doing this a month from now because we'll have a lot more answers (laughs) to make it very, very simple. If you look at China's history since the Chinese Communist Party took over, they had roughly 30 years of one-man rule with Mao Zedong. And after 30 years of one-man rule, after the Cultural Revolution, 30 million dead, after the Great Leap Forward, 20 million dead, the party decided, let's not do that again. From now on, we'll do management by committee. 
Of course, if you look at it from the US, you might think that management by a bunch of competent technocrats is far inferior to democracy. And I agree with that. But it's a whole lot better than one man rule. Because one man rule, as we're now seeing in Russia, can lead to accidents. The guy at the top decides to do something and that something is a mistake and it's hard to reverse course. Actually, you don't need to go to Russia. You could see it in China today with the zero COVID policies that make zero sense. The big mistake there on the zero COVID is at the start of the crisis, Xi Jinping said, I'm in charge. There's a great article on this in the last issue of Foreign Affairs. That's the stupidest thing. As a manager, what you do is you appoint somebody else to be in charge. If it doesn't go well, you fire that guy. He can be the scapegoat and you put on another guy. The big problem in China is you've drifted from management by committee to one man rule. This is what the coming party Congress really has to figure out. Are we basically going to entrench one man rule in China? And if we do, you crank up the level of political risk. Or do we go back to management by committee, in which case you massively crank down the level of political risk and you make things like an invasion of Taiwan very unlikely? I think you'll need to look for key markers. The first key marker is, is Li Keijong, the current premier, given another job? Because Li Keijong, he's too old to stay premier, but he's not so old that he needs to leave the standing committee of the Politburo. If he's given another job, say maybe the head of the Congress or the head of the parliament, and he stays on the standing committee, that's a very important sign because he's basically been the one force clashing with Xi Jinping. If he's put out to pasture, that's not a great sign. The other massive sign will be who replaces Li Keijong as premier. Is it a Xi Jinping crony or is it somebody that is not from the Xi Jinping faction within the party? If you come out of the party congress with Xi Jinping proclaimed as dictator for life for all intents and purposes, if you come out with a premier who's a Xi Jinping crony, and if Li Keijong is put out to pasture, that's not a great sign. Today, that's more or less what the market is expecting. On the flip side, if the party comes out and says, okay, Xi Jinping gets another mandate for five years, but in five years' time, he's done, and it'll be these guys who will be in charge in five years, the Chinese markets will rally a lot. All of a sudden, the perception is no man is bigger than the party. The CCP has put Xi Jinping back in this box. China's investable once again. Let's see you in a month. We can chat again if you want. <laughs> All right. Always have to ask, what else is on your mind? Where to start? <laughs> the main thing on my mind is the perception of the market is China's about to hit the wall big time because of its real estate problems and political problems and slowdown, et cetera, all of which are very real. And Europe is about to hit the wall big time because it's going to run out of energy and political crisis and Italian election and euro imploding. And by the way, I can paint a negative picture on Europe with the best of them. That's the perception right now. So option one, this happens. China blows up, Europe blows up, then fine, you're good in the US and stay there. Option two, we go through this winter and actually neither of these things happen. Turns out the electricity doesn't come out in Europe. China doesn't completely implode because we have a good party Congress. They start dealing with the real estate. Xi Jinping is put back into a box, in which case a lot of assets in China, a lot of assets in Europe are completely mispriced. So that's option two. Option three, you actually start running into a genuine problem in the US with massively disappointing earnings, slowing economy, and massively underfunded pension fund, in which case then it's the US that's completely mispriced. Right now, when you look at how people are positioned, everybody's positioned for option one. The US is the only place to be. I think the odds of option two are actually pretty decent. I'm not saying Europe is going to be awesome, but it manages as it always does to muddle through. It bends the rules because that's what Europe does. Somehow it muddles through this winter and so does China. So my big fear is that actually we get to option three, where perhaps we start having real issues in the US, and then a lot of assets are deeply mispriced. All right, Louis, I did ask you most of the normal closing questions the last time we spoke, but I have a few more (laughs) to throw your way. So the first is, what type of investment are you like a moth to the flame? There's three ways to make money, right? There's return to the mean trades, there's momentum trades, and there's carry trades. I get bored with carry trades. It's not exciting enough. Momentum trades, I always feel dirty when I do a momentum (laughs) trade. So I'm an absolute sucker for the return to the mean trades, things that nobody likes that are beaten up, three-legged donkeys. You've got a three-legged donkey, come show me. I'm going to find him handsome. That's my big weakness, which I always try to fight against. I'm always trying to find the things that are oversold that everybody hates, etc. Partly, I think it's vanity, to be honest, because there's a certain pleasure in saying, oh, I'm right against everybody else. It's the vanity in me that brings me into these things because when they work out, it's so fun. On the flip side of that, what do you think is your biggest blind spot? That's part of my blind spot, looking for things that nobody else likes. And usually I think I'm pretty decent at identifying trends. And I've written a lot of books about trends when they were decently early. 
I think I tend to get out too early. I'm the guy who buys Bitcoin at $3 and sells it at 6 thinking, <laughs> sucker, <laughs> to the next guy as I sell it on. That's me right there. I don't stay with a trend long enough. Louis, thanks as always for sharing your views. Really interesting to hear what you're thinking as these markets move around. Great to see you, Ted. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com, where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one, and see you next time. 